one student said, I'm really, really worried. I feel despair about the climate crisis. I said, there isn't one. My guest today is Git Agrippa. I am an architect. I live in London. I have been now living in London for 36 years. Um, as you probably can hear from my accent, I'm not British. I was born outside the UK. I was already a qualified architect when I came to this country. And um, the reason I came here was because I met my husband, then and current, uh, back where I am from. And I moved here to be with him and I've been with him ever since. And uh, for the last 30 years, I've been running my own architectural practice. Do you want to talk yet about why you're appearing not as yourself, but as an avatar? Um, because of the subject matter we're going to talk about today. Uh, as in your own words, Tom, I'm a climate realist. I wouldn't, I am also a skeptic, but most importantly, I'm a realist. Um, and as an architect, it's too much of a, um, I don't know, risk um, to my business to come out openly saying that I do not agree with the current popular discourse on climate. I um, do not agree that the proposals suggested, the restrictions the governments are proposing are realistic or helpful for the humanity. And um, saying this openly presents a risk to my business. That's why I'm an avatar. I do not want to disclose my name because of that reason. I discovered you as Git Agrippa on Twitter. You have a very good, a very uh, information-filled Twitter feed. And do you want to talk about how you became a well-informed climate skeptic? Thank you for saying my Twitter is very informed. Actually, it's quite thin. I don't have time and I don't like writing anything inaccurate and I do not want to react willy-nilly to anything written there. Mm. So, well, thank you. I, it all started in the early 2000s, as you probably remember yourself, the whole discussion about global warming was becoming very prominent on the mainstream media. It was in the background and just going there, like, I don't know what, in, like any, any other life matter. And um, one day I read this article I think it was 2009. I have to say, I kept that article for a very, very long time. Recently, I moved offices, and I think I have thrown it away. It was in the supplement of uh, a, the, the then called the Sunday Independent newspaper. There was an interview with some influential uh, people of Britain, including the ex-Chancellor of Exchequer, Nigel Lawson, and the botanist David Bellamy. They were asked the question, is the earth really being, is the earth really getting warm? And is, are the humans the cause of this? So I thought their answers were very well considered and realistic. Nigel Lawson said, well, I just wrote a book about it. I was commissioned by Tony Blair. As a, it is a dumb thing in this country. I'm sure to say in the States, you can commission well-known ex-politicians to look into something. That could be, for example, over drug use by the young people. But this time it was this. He was asked to go and check what is behind this, why is everyone flapping about. And he wrote a book about it. It is called An Appeal to Reason, A Cool Look at Global Warming by Nigel Lawson. It's a very good book. I would recommend to, it to any, anybody now, everyone now, still. Um, he found out, he, he concluded that there may be some warming by humans. But, and he sat down and spoke to scientists and did Come, they come up with a possible a realistic calculation of an increase in the 
atmospheric temperature caused by humans due to CO2 emissions so negligible, the, the effects could only be positive, he concluded. It happens that I don't necessarily necessarily think that CO2 is warming. Human, human emitted CO2 is warming the earth myself currently. I do not think that, but it doesn't matter what I think, really, because I want I decided that okay, I'm gonna move on from now on, but say that we are warming. Say so that. Uh, I do not get challenged, oh, you are not a climate scientist, what do you know about it? Say that I am allowing myself to be challenged, although as I think often that you don't have to be an astrophysicist to think that there is a solar uh, system and the sun is a star. Um, and I also don't like to use the word believe, so I'm going around our conversation, but I'll get back to my point. I always say think, because I am thinking. This is not a belief system. And I, I resent the word climate denier. And some very well scientists, in inverted commas, very well known scientists, regularly use this uh, climate denier term. And I regularly pick on them, saying, what does that mean? Nobody's denying there is a climate. What does that mean? It's just to put people like me down, just to 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 bully us, actually, and um, and I'll get there. So back back to the book. When I um, and then I also read what David Bellamy said. David Bellamy was literally laughing. How it? How can this be possible? He said the biggest greenhouse gas is vapor vapor. Uh, water vapor, i.e. the clouds. So this is this conversation and I are having is not about that because you have interviewed some serious people about this. I have nothing to add. My point is how back in 2009, this could be talked about in a national newspaper. People who didn't think so could be interviewed, even by the BBC. And um, I was intrigued and I started to read more about this subject and I started following Roy Spencer, I still do, on the Ice Cap US, his blog. And then I bought Robert Carter's book. I find a good book like that. I buy more than one and I hand it up to people. Yes, Climate, the Counter Consensus by Robert Carter is an Australian scientist. He has since died, since the publication of this book. And it's out of print, but you can get it on Amazon secondhand. It's an, one of the best books I read on the subject because it explains it extremely well and is in, an very, in an understandable manner for, by people like me. At the end of the book, there's a chapter about how the institutions like the BBC, actually how the BBC made it a duty for themselves to go with it with this agenda and actually work towards banning people who don't agree so being ever being broadcast or interviewed on the BBC. And he has reference to internal meetings held by the BBC on this subject. So I read that book and then I actually, my daughter's birth and teenagers, I got them to read the Nigel Lawson book, which I'm not sure whether they read cover to cover, but they got the idea. They became physicists, not because of that book, <laughs> obviously not. They were interested in science. They both became physicists and studied in different universities. But whenever I went to school meetings, parents' meetings at one of my daughter's schools. They went to different schools, secondary schools. Um, I used to see in the library, they used to lay out wine and nibbles for the parents and in the school library. And I used to see these books on the shelves open and being advertised saying climate change, climate crisis. This is about 10 years ago or a bit longer maybe. 
12 years ago, I used to pick them up. All the men hide there. So that the kids wouldn't be brainwashed. Because they were brainwashing the children, and they did. A lot of them. I don't know how it's going to be reversed. Um, so then I was noticing this shutdown discussion, and that was only making me more interested on the subject. Why are these people trying to stop the discussion? Surely that can only make one more suspicious and skeptic. Why am I not allowed to discuss this? I mean, you don't have to be a genius to work that one out. Uh, one day, I was having dinner with a good friend of mine who was the editor then, a very prominent architectural, weekly architectural journal. So we were talking like this. So I, I said, look, this is the subject matter came up. But then it was all still global warming, by the way. Uh, I said, look, this is what I think, and this is why. Oh, she said, sounds really interesting. Can you write an email about this, sort of summarizing what you think and why and where you found you know, some references to some books and articles? I said, sure. And uh, then I um, wrote this <laughs> email to her. Um, and then the magazine ran a leader on it. It read, is global warming a lot of hot air? Oh my goodness. A storm broke out. The amount of people writing to the magazine with personal insults. How dare you question this? I thought, we thought journalism was about questioning. You can say you don't agree, but you can't say you can't publish anything like this. I mean, to me, it's mind boggling. It was, and it still is. It became so bad that we had to support uh, with letters. We had to support some of us, but very few. We had to write uh, and in and say, look, we agree with, with her. Like, uh, some of us, not all of us, in questioning. I'm not saying not all of us, not many of us, some. And then <laughs> I had in my office, I have staff working for me then, still do, but you know, one of my colleagues got a text from a friend of hers who said, OMG, your boss is a denier. You see why I'm an avatar now? <laughs> I mean, so this is, this is how it, it started with me. But I was, um, I didn't really, I started talking about this less and less among my architectural colleagues to my employees because they were horrified. They literally were horrified. We did thought that I could think otherwise, that there was another discussion. Because one of them once said to me, how can you say this when there are so many scientists say that there is a, a global warming crisis caused by the humans and you don't agree with that? I said, but there are very, very many who don't think so. And you don't get to read about them. And you don't get to read what they are. That's what makes me furious. That all media, everyone now. But they can say whatever they want, but they will not publish an opposing or an opposite view on this subject. Uh, the Economist newspaper used to be a skeptic and the editor changed and it now it just is like a lead, <laughs> one of the lead publications in the country. 
who is just um, blowing their trumpet. I mean, I don't think there is anything wrong for people to say humans are um, causing the planet to warm, but I think there is a lot wrong to say that there is a crisis. We're all going to die in like five years, ten years, or whatever. And there is a lot wrong with what they are telling us to do. I mean, the governments are telling us to do. That's what I really have very strong views about, about what they are telling us to do. So all this uh, hoo-ha about the global warming and climate change created a very good opportunity for the construction industry professionals to, in inverted commas, become climate warriors. It is literally impossible to build and not omit CO2. It just isn't possible. I mean, what are they talking about? They're just jumping on the bandwagon and writing on their websites, oh, we are this, we are that, which is just not true. To this day, I haven't got anything on my website with any reference to sustainability. I don't have any problem with sustainability. I don't have any problem with protecting the environment. But trying to make a trade out of it based on packs of lies, I have a lot to do, a lot of um, anger about it, against it. Um, so the council started asking us architects to do extra work when we submit our applications for permissions about what we are doing about the climate change, what we're doing about the environment. But in the UK, we have a building code. It's protected by the Act of Parliament. It's the law. We can't build anything that does not comply with the current building regulations. It's all laid out there. It's criminal otherwise. You can't do it. But depends on the type of project, whether it's criminal or not, but it's against the law. You, you would be practicing unlawfully if you don't comply with them. Why would any sensible architect do that? Now, they have they've been trying to introduce, they have introduced uh, the Architects Registration Board in this country introduced compulsory courses on uh, environmental, what do they call it? Sustainability and environment, and also fire, because we had a disaster a few years ago, uh, 70 people died. But these are all governed by the building regulations. When you read it, what they are asking us to do, I'm doing that anyway, because I have to, for example, understand the principles of human comfort and indoor air quality in relation to energy use. But we have to. And then understand the embodied carbon and resource implications of different methods of construction and performance of building materials. This is nothing to do with building code. This is propaganda. And now a professional body is making it compulsory for us architects to go to a course and learn about this over and above our uh, qualifications. And they said, if you don't, and if you don't show us that you attended this course, we're going to struck you. I, I, I'm astounded. I'm questioning the legality of it in my head. I don't know. But, and I don't, the language they use, we have to go and learn this. Not develop our knowledge, learn that this is what's happening. And they call it whole life carbon and low embodied carbon design. These are one of the one of the headlines they have listed that we, we should be going and looking into. The climate framework, Arctic's climate action network, they supply, they provide courses if you want to, you know, 
pick one of these. They have given us 10, 15 names. One of them is actually on one of the one of these organizations or groups that, that offer these courses uh, or papers. You can pick and read. They have their they have the Extinction Rebellion name on it. I mean, these people are these people are arrested on the streets of London for throwing soup on artwork for blocking roads so people die in ambulances, and an architect's body is suggesting a course with their name on it. I mean, Tom, you tell me. You tell me what you think. What is happening? Uh, it, it's completely crazy. I mean, uh, are, is there any hope here that uh, peak hysteria is passed or in London? Are you at peak hysteria right now, do you think? I think peak hysteria is such, suffering a little bit of fatigue because of reality is hitting. With the war between Russia and Ukraine, energy supplies being disrupted. And it's just you and I know that there is no other way to heat our homes. I mean, even if it's electric vehicle and electricity, you and I know where is that going to come from? <laughs> I'll get back to that. Maybe I am able to talk again about this, I feel like, among friends. You can't speak out publicly, but I was wondering when you speak privately with other maybe architects, do they ever uh, say, you know, this is all baloney at all? Anybody else? Very few. M maybe none. And the ones that, are they, they are architects, but they don't practice as architects. The ones that will agree with me are researchers or uh, lecturers or journalists, if you see what I mean. Um, one of two things happened to me. One of them is quite old experience. When I was uh, becoming, I'm a, I'm a member of the RIBA, Royal Institute of British Architects. And then you can be a, a member as a practice, a company. For that, you pay a bit of extra and you have, you have you'll become more chartered a chartered member. So for that, they asked us to fill in the form and one of them, in the form, there was a condition. It said, I, as the director, will do my best to ensure that the, my employees, employees come to work using envi environmentally friendly transport. So why would I want to what sort of nonsense is this? I mean, it's like living in Soviet Russia, literally. It's like being run by Bolsheviks, so I refused. And I didn't become a chartered member, I mean, my company. When they phoned me up to chase, saying, why aren't you, because they, take, they get more money, so they chased you, saying, oh, why aren't you becoming a member? I said, because of this clause. Oh, he said, just tick the box. I'm not going to just tick the box. This is how <laughs> young people have got brainwashed, literally brainwashed by these people. Uh, and then most recently, as I was saying to you, we have to comply with the building rigs and we have to show people, the local authority that we have built, we are building this, whatever it is. Uh, whilst we're building it, we're complying with the current building regulations. We have to submit reports, calculations, everything. They want extra reports now. But I said, why do you want this extra report? You write in this extra report like this. I ensure, I will ensure that the lorries come to sight. We lose da 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 da. I'm sh I said, but this doesn't make sense. Oh, he said, just cut and paste, make a report. So it's, it's very upsetting for me being asked to go on to this compulsory course. So I was going to deregister myself, but then I said, maybe I won't. Because I found out that I can record, if I go and read one of these things they have suggested, there's no other thing wrong, see what they are saying. And um, there's nothing wrong with going and listening to an opposing view. 
if that's what I'm trying to say. If I go and um, read or listen to one or one or two of them, and I'm supposed to reflect and comment on my what I learned, and I thought that's when I will I will write, saying this is a lot of nonsense. And then see what they did, they do to me then. Because by law, they can't deregister me for saying I don't agree with this. If you see what I mean. Because I'm still complying with the building regulations. My projects have to, otherwise I can't build anyway. So if their aim is to change the way I think, that's against the law in the States as well as here, as you and I know. So I thought that will... I thought that would be a good way of challenging them. Would you agree? Yeah, I love that idea. I think that's fantastic. Well, I think it's a good idea. Why should I deregister myself because of these, excuse me, I'm going to be rude, because of these clowns? It's a great idea for you to go to the course and then write all sorts of comments about how this is all baloney. I love that idea. I'm going to do that and see what they do. I bet you they won't do anything. Do you know why? Because they don't even read it. Well, let's see. I'm just very curious. I'll I'll let you know. I'll yeah. report back. Since you asked about my, this is what's happening with my friends. It became so bad about not agreeing with the climate being changed by human beings among friends and colleagues that I just, this is not recently, this is safe five, six, before the pandemic, I would just be quiet all the time. So if I have to say anything, it would be literally worse than saying in a very, say, imagine a very religious country, maybe a very religious. It would be easier to say you don't believe in God in Saudi Arabia than say you don't believe that there's a man-made climate change on earth here in this country. That became so bad. And so I, I had to sort of stop people and say, look, I'm going to tell you something, but you might be upset. That's what I used to say, people, to people, how I used to say to my friends, I don't agree with this um, argument. But recently, something promising happened. I was asked to join a panel discussion about ethics and the environment. And I said to myself, do I really want to do this? That panel discussion was about um, for um, a group of students who have pay, had paid to attend this five-week private course organized by a school of architecture. And um, I was asked to be a part of the panel. And I said to myself, do I really want to be a part of this? Expose myself and tell them what I... I'll, I I said, okay, I'll go and see what I'll say. Maybe I'll say nothing. Much. Of course. I couldn't keep it shut. Put up. Because um, there was a philosopher in the panel and then head of an architectural school, a department head of an architectural school and myself. There were students who were asking us questions and we were answering. The event philosopher was indirectly asked uh, about the climate change and the uh, humans uh, being the reason for it. He said, look, I understand that other people might think otherwise. And I understand that um, in all parts, I agree that everyone should be listened to and published their thoughts. But I think it must be very annoying for the experts to know that the climate is changed by humans. And then there's these agitators saying it is not. And he said he believes that we are changing it. I said to him, I turned around and said to him, those experts, I said, who are agitated by the skeptics, do they in include, are they similar to the experts that uh, threatened to burn Galileo alive? Students love that. And um, at the end of the discussion, to, when the whole uh, come, you know, panel discussion was over, one student said, I'm really, really worried. I feel despair about the climate crisis. 
I said, there isn't one. And if you want to know why not, come and see me after the talk. I'll give you a bunch of books name, bunch of book names to read and some podcasts. And Tom, I gave yours. Oh, nice. And I said to him, this podcast is brilliant because the, there are interviews with people who are really, who really know what they're talking about. And then I said, you must listen to Patrick Moore one because I think it's a very good one. The Patrick Moore one. And also she, he was the co-founder of Greenpeace. It's a, always a good cred credential, isn't it? Um, so they, at the end of the uh, discussion, they, a group of them, I was surrounded by a group of them. They were so hopeful because they wanted to believe. I'm saying believe, you know, disbelieve that we're all going to die. Because they want to talk. Honestly, these young people are so badly affected by this propaganda. Yeah, that gives me a lot of hope that uh, young people were crowding around and actually listening to you. Uh, that makes me very happy. That's great. Yes, it is. Because they're not, we are not allowed to ignore, and I'm not, I'm not the one who's going to explain, but no one is allowed to explain this. Uh, they were... Nigel Lawson was interviewed on the radio 10 years ago on BBC Radio 4. People were so outraged that he would be given a platform. There were serious complaints about it. I mean, but that can only be, that can only indicate that there is something cynical going on. Do you think the same, Tom? I, I do. Yeah, yeah, something sinister is going on. Uh, from my perspective, I think the worm is turning. I think uh, there's a, an awakening happening right now, and I think uh, the, the worst has passed us. And as more and more people like you speak out, I think uh, it's going to crumble. I, I am positive. But thank you also. I mean, as you know, I came across with your um, blog through tw Twitter, and then I wrote to you saying thank you for doing these fantastic podcasts and you wrote, and then we have another connection. We have a common friend, but it's just a coincidence. And so I thank you for doing this. It's such great work. I mean, thank you. we are so lucky that you exist, literally. And you put all these people together. I mean, people, people we need people like you. You, you are far well, too kind. Who's not an avatar, sorry. You're far too kind, but th thanks for yeah, the no. kind words. You mentioned you have two daughters that are physicists, but uh, you're getting laughed at by the uh, what the cohorts of one of the daughters because yes. of your stance. Yeah. Yes, I mean we're all friendly. They respect me, but they don't say it to my face. But they say to my daughter, "What? Your mother doesn't believe that the climate is being changed by humans? Ha ha ha!" That's um. I don't want to name which university it is, but there are two different universities. One of them is more realistic and commercial. The realistic and commercial one, they don't laugh at me. The other ones, they are more academics. They are laughing at me. I said to her, we'll see who's going who's gonna to have the last laugh. Good for you. You have enough self-confidence. I love that, that uh, you just say what you think is the truth and let them laugh. I love that stance. <laughs> that is funny. I don't know how good it's going to do to me eventually. We'll find out. No, the truth will come out. I'm outraged, or rather I should say I'm enraged by the Western politicians and with what they are doing currently. When this, this, hysteria, when this hysteria started, and it, it was... It was um, in 2009, as I soon after 2009, like 2010, 11, soon after I read Nigel Lawson book and Bob Garter book, I was saying to my husband, these people are mad. What are they trying to do? My husband said, it will never take off in the United States. They are too far too clever for this. Why would they self-destruct themselves knowing that economy cannot exist without fossil fuels? That's why I am saying something sinister is going on, has been going on, because we know it isn't possible. That's one reason I'm enraged. The second reason, that this, to, a follow, as a follow-up, I must add that 
these people are shutting down their economies by canceling fossil fuel use, by trying to cancel fossil fuel use, stopping extracting their own oil, gas, gas pipeline, Biden stopped. And then they are getting the taxpayers either to sponsor, subsidize, or directly use their money to buy these ineffective equipment, I call them, like windmills, like um, Latin Marauder calls them windmills, and I do that on purpose to insult. Uh, and and um, solar panels made in autocratic countries under dubious circumstances by emitting CO2. I mean, CO2 doesn't go in a tank, sit above China. What are they doing? This is, to me, this is treason. These should, people should be brought to trial and jailed. I really think this is treason. And we are paying money to these people who are bringing these useless equipment over here. Damaging the, damaging, really damaging biodiversity and the wildlife. I don't believe any head of state can be so stupid. I think there, I think there's an ulterior motive going in there and they really should be tried and jailed. They should be hunted down. That's what I think. I do, let's see, uh, I like the way you think. Um, some other uh, things I wanted to mention here that the reasons that I am uh, optimistic is I was just listening on my phone to uh, Joe Rogan. Chris Williamson was on there. and Oh, was he? Okay. Yep. I just listened to it. And uh, constantly on Joe Rogan, uh, climate is coming up as an aside. And again, it came up and they both kind of scoffed at it about how ridiculous it is, which is important because so many people listen to Rogan. And that's a big change for Rogan. I think he had Candace, he was talking to Candace Owens and he was absolutely shocked that she didn't believe in the climate scam some years ago, but now he is scoffing at it over and over. You just keep scoffing. Oh, I love that. I'm really pleased to hear. Yeah. And then um, Tucker Carlson too. Uh, Willie Soon's on Tucker Carlson getting millions of views. And then there's a little clip of Willie talking uh, in, uh, on Twitter and that one, just a little clip has 5 million views. So we have uh, millions of people uh, being exposed to this all the time. And these audiences are bigger than the CNNs and the Foxes, et cetera. So I think the worm is absolutely turning. And then uh, I wanted to mention, uh, I don't, you've re uh, watched The Great Global Warming Swindle. There's of another course. sequel coming out, and I think that's going to help. Uh, help. As I well. hope so. Yeah. I can't wait for that. I know Martin, and um, I'm a big fan of his. I can't wait for the second one. I can't wait. Tell me where it's going to be out tom it is coming out on uh on youtube etc on march 21 so it's coming right up here in a, a month away we must heavily share it on twitter yes. regularly so that people know this you know they can watch this film yeah i think it's going to be important to uh, spread the word virally yes. and uh, people tell your friends etc and make sure everybody knows about it yeah that'll yes. be good yes and then uh we wanted to state uh, the the main a main point of this interview that we're doing here is the fact that you have to do it as an avatar. I think it's just amazing that uh, professionally you can't just come on here and uh, give your real name and because it's just a uh, poisonous still. It, it's amazing in 2024 that you can't say you don't believe in the climate scam without repercussions. No, that's right. And um, I hope that changes because I find it deeply saddening to be in this to, i find it deeply saddening that this country has come to this again i'm confident that it will change i mean there was just uh with this uh this pandemic there was all sorts of things you couldn't say three years ago that are mainstream everybody's saying them now it's i think climate's going to follow a similar pattern yeah yes i do also think that there's a big reason of, of there's a big reason that the social media is so fast, so people get influenced very quickly. But then, of course, it can die very quickly for the same reason as well. It spreads and then it gets extinguished. 
Wait, but I find it unacceptable that BBC would not allow anyone to, to utter a word about this in an opposing view. Oh, it'll be interesting to see when they change that policy, if ever. The headline on Reuters is J.P. Morgan State Street quit climate group. BlackRock steps back too. So, uh, yeah. Good. That type of thing is very, very encouraging. Uh, any other points you want to make before we go ahead and wrap this one up? No, thank you. That's it. Um, but thank you for giving me this opportunity, Tom. No, I really appreciate you being on here, and everyone should follow you at uh, Get Agrippa on Twitter. So thank you for your work. I really Thanks. appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. We'll talk to you next time. Goodbye. Yep, bye.